So I'm right in the middle. All right. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Jeff, for the uh, good overview of uh, blastomycosis. And uh, I'm lucky enough to today be able to um, present a case that I think is quite interesting and unusual, um, being uh, pulmonary blastomycosis in a red panda. And then hopefully I'll be able to try and put some significance to the findings and these imported cases. And we can have a quick discussion about um, what could be the significant factors that might be pertaining to could we be introducing blasto into British Columbia or would it even be able to stay here. So uh, a 14, approximately 14 month old male red panda was presented for necropsy at the Animal Health Center um, in, uh, recently. Approximately two months prior to that, this panda and its conspecific twin brother was uh, transported from a, a different zoo in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Uh, upon arriving here in British Columbia, uh, they were immediately put under uh, very strict quarantine procedures with limited uh, access or contact with humans and also no access to the outside and importantly no access to soil. During quarantine, both these pandas maintained a normal healthy demeanor, healthy appetite until at some point one of the pandas had a sudden decomp the respiratory decompensation, acute respiratory distress and unfortunately it succumbed before any clinical intervention could be attempted. And that uh, panda was then submitted for a full post-mortem evaluation at our provincial, local provincial AVLD accredited uh, diagnostic laboratory. So apart from that, this panda actually visibly had a very fluffy and voluminous coat. It was actually in very poor body condition and had marked bony prominences and uh, decreased muscle mass, loss of uh, subcutaneous and visceral fat stores. And importantly, upon opening the thoracic cavity, uh, the, the lungs had a disseminated pyogranu whoops, pyogranulomatous pneumonia that uh, effaced probably about 60% of the normal lung tissue. And you can see them as nodules scattered throughout uh, the lungs there, but then also nodules scattered throughout the pericardial sac here through the mediastinum. There was multiple firm adhesions between the lungs and the chest wall and the diaphragm. Uh-oh. It's still there. I don't know. I don't trust that. Pointer. OK, cool. And uh, it's a little bit hard to see in this image, but there's also about 15 milliliters of this thick, tenacious, mucoid, yellow, purulent uh, exudate. And uh, on histological sections then of these affected lung tissues um, revealed, again, myriad of uh, disseminated areas of pyogranulomatous inflammation, but they were also encapsulated in fibrous connective tissue bands, granulation tissue, and then, as you can see, dotted throughout here with these little arrows, almost with a little bit of a halo around them, you can see multiple little yeast, fungal yeast bodies. And in the nasal cavity of this panda as well, there was multiple areas of ulceration. And again, in the underlying tissue, there are again these poorly demarcated pyogranulomatous areas of inflammation. And again, with the same dotted fungal yeast body scattered throughout. So with this, we already we finally made a diagnosis that this is a systemic fungal disease, kind of an unusual diagnosis to be making uh, in BC and in this species. So um, we wanted to better characterize it, so we, we had to do a couple of special stains. And firstly, uh, as you expected for most fungal organisms, a PAS and a GMS stain uh, was positive. And just to give you an idea of the abundance of organisms in this case, in this low magnification GMS stain section, every single little black dot is essentially a scattered yeast throughout that tissue. Um, this fungus was about 10 to 15 micrometers in diameter. It was round and it had a very prominent, as I referred to before, as this clear halo around it, a clear non-staining capsule or wall, and which was also with a mucy carmine stain, stain negative, which mostly ruled out the more common fungal disease that we would expect here on the West Coast being cryptococcosis. But 
It is, like Jeff mentioned, the most significant finding and highlighted here in this PAS stain section was that these yeasts exhibited very prominent broad-based budding as they are rep and during reproduction. And this is a feature that is all pretty much near pathognomonic for Blastomyces dermatitis. Because blastomycosis would be a very unusual diagnosis to be making in BC and a very unusual mammalian host, uh, we, and based on the, the guidelines that Eleni talked about this morning, uh, we reported this to the BC CDC and also submitted some fresh frozen lung tissue uh, and then doc to Dr. Lindo Ang, who then further confirmed the presence of blastomyces through ITS fungal gene sequencing. But in addition to this, uh, apart from the fibrous organization that was scattered throughout the lungs and in these lesions, which gave us a big indication of chronicity, there was also a really marked uh, bone marrow hyperplasia, which was sustained systemic inflammation, and therefore, again, indicating that this is a very chronic protracted disease process. But the most, and I've left this one to the last of the findings, the most interesting finding, I think, in this uh, Panda was that many of these yeast bodies themselves actually contained these somewhat, and this is under polarized light, uh, these kind of radiating, about four of them, almost forming little Maltese cross, refractile bodies that probably maybe represent some sp uh, spore formation. And this might be an indication that this fungus or this yeast was actually reverting back to the mycelial form and sort of trying to attempt, perhaps attempt, to make spores, and this could potentially represent a source for environmental contamination, although you know, maybe it may be limited or not. So in conclusion, we confirmed uh, all the histological features, and so it was consistent with a case of pulmonary blastomycosis, and uh, that the lesions that were present both in the lungs or restricted to the lungs and to the nasal cavity only was consistent with uh, infection through inhalation, which we heard from Jeff, is usually the most common route of infection. And with the skin sort of manifestations usually being more an extra pulmonary manifestation rather than a primary inoculation. The extensive involvement of the lung, more than 60% of it almost being effaced, the massive fibrous connective tissue in there, as well as the accompanying bone marrow hyperplasia and the poor body condition, uh, again, led to a conclusion that this was a very chronic disease process. And then given this chronic uh, the level of chronicity and uh, the obviously strict quarantine procedures that had kept this panda away from any external uh, um, exposure, uh, it was highly unlikely that this infection occurred in BC itself. And probably the, pandas, or the panda was infected prior to being brought to BC from Manitoba. So that's a picture of Winnipeg as our endemic region, if anyone might recognize it. Um, and then because, as was mentioned before, the mycelial form and the resultant spores are the most significant, in, or is the infectious stage, and because we don't usually see these stages within the um, tissues itself, it is uh, the risk for direct transmission to humans or through horizontal spread between humans and animals is considered to be highly unlikely. And that uh, Jeff has touched on as well, that uh, is transflected in the reports as well, where there's very minimal actual reports of direct transmission from an infected animal to a human, and that's been limited to a dog bite, to cat scratch, or through accidental inoculation while performing necropsy on a, on a dog. Therefore, the direct transmission to the company conspecific panda in this case is also highly unlikely. But I would like to just refer back to those potential spores that may be forming that could be uh, resulting in a environmental contamination. But that panda or all other in-contact in pandas, as well as humans that were in contact with it, could have been exposed to the same environmental source back in Manitoba. But to date, all in-contact pandas and humans, for that matter, are actually doing pretty well. And this is unfortunately where things sort of become a little bit more gray and muddled. And as Jeff had mentioned, we know very well where the endemic or hyperendemic regions across Canada, US, and, and the world is. But, and, and it's exposure to those endemic regions that's probably the most significant risk factor to acquiring the disease. However, we actually know very little about the exact habitat 
or environmental determinants in those regions that allow for the persistence or endemicity of blastomycosis. We do know it's associated with warm soils, with wet soils, um, generally in wooded areas, and obviously then with a rich organic material present in the, the sand itself, and then close to waterways or lakes or other bodies of water. And as Jeff mentioned as well, there may be some indication that persistent or changing climatic factors may have a significant effect on disease outbreaks or presence of the disease as well. And for one, uh, as an example, a couple of years ago, there was an outbreak in Wisconsin where it was eventually associated with a precipitous decline in precipitation and then a sudden return of the rains, which led to a huge number of uh, outbreak cases. To further complicate our inability to sort of pinpoint this fungus to specific uh, environments or habitats uh, in these endemic regions is that it's exceedingly difficult to culture this fungus from environmental samples. And as such, you can see there's a whole number of different methods that people have tried to better uh, establish distribution for blastomycosis, but there's been less than a handful of actual successful reports. And if we can't isolate exactly where the uh, fungus could be in the environment, it still makes it quite difficult to identify what the exact risk exposures could be, whether it be from an outside occupation or through uh, swimming in specific water, or even you know, if it's in the soil, how deep is it in the soil? How deep do you need to dig down uh, to be able to, to get infected? So with that, obviously, I think there's a whole bunch, and maybe I'm ending this, uh, this presentation more on asking questions of everyone else rather than people asking me questions as well. But uh, we were hoping to, dis to get a little bit of discussion on what could the potential risk be of. We obviously have some cases where we have brought blasto into BC, but is there a significant risk associated with that? Will we have BC actually being introduced in blasto, actually introduced in BC? So what is the likelihood and significance of an affected individual or a uh, animal or human actually shedding the, the organism into the environment? So for example, going back to this panda again that potentially has spores, potentially reverting back to the mycelial form. And if it does actually, if it is actually able to produce spores that go into the environment, what's the chance of the spores actually surviving? So what's the abiotic or biotic factors that may make it possible for this fungus to survive, propagate, or establish endemicity in a new area? And then an interesting uh, question that uh, has sort of been brought up in some of the literature as well is, could there be different blastomyces strains with different pathogenicities and uh, that are adapted to different environmental areas? So could there actually be a situation where we do have blasto strains in BC, but maybe they're just not pathogenic? And we don't know because we're either not looking for them or we're not able to culture them when we do try. Okay. And then last question would just be, what, uh, uh, with the risk being people uh, being exposed to endemic areas, what is the risk of British Columbians so or animals in British Columbia actually accessing these endemic or hyperendemic regions to be able to bring back blastomyces to BC? So if there is time, I guess, for Richard um, from Manitoba, he was involved from the public health side with this panda, and he can give us a quick just update on what it, the situation is in an endemic or hyperendemic region where these pandas originated from. Thank you. Yes, I've only got four seconds. 